Welcome to the wonderful world of dance, bringing you exclusive interviews with top dancers and choreographers and reviews of the world's best companies across the globe. You can find lots more on our website at thewonderfulworldofdance.com. Hi, this is Savannah Saunders from The Wonderful World of Dance and today I'm so excited to be speaking with Emma Gladstone, Artistic Director and Chief Executive of Dance Umbrella, London's largest dance festival, running from the 11th to the 28th of October in the capital. So let's hear all about the festival. Hi Emma, thanks so much for joining us. Hi Savannah, very nice to be here. So tell us all about this exciting festival. Well, um, it's been going a very long time, this festival. It's been, uh, we're 39 this year. I took over four years ago and um, I'm really trying to push on two different areas. One is to get all the work that we invite out and about in the city. So we're doing quite a bit of touring this year and uh, we're going to 17 venues, uh, including to Zone 5, which I'm really happy about. Um, but also I'm excited to look at different kinds of choreography. So it's essentially a contemporary dance festival, but um, we've got um, lots of different styles uh, within that. Some flamenco, some um, where the audience put on headphones, um, different work for children with projection and digital. So it's, it's important for me to show the range of what artists are making now. And with almost three weeks of this amazing contemporary dance hitting the capital, what are some of your personal highlights that you would like to draw attention to? Um, we always do a free show a year and we're opening the festival at Battersea Power Station and then touring that show Origami down the river. And it's, um, it's in a, a, a dancer called Sachi Noro in our shipping container that opens up literally like a piece wow. of paper, the metal moving. And she's dancing inside that and around it. And I love it as a piece of work because it's partly very spectacular, but not in um, a kind of tricksy way. The actual choreography is really good. It's, sl it's rather meditative and calming because she's almost flying in the air. Um, so that's going to be a really great way to start. And uh, um, we've invited a guest uh, programmer to come in this year, Freddie Apokuwadai. So I'm also really interested to see what he brings. There's several artists I don't know. I haven't seen the work. And um, he's got some bands on each night as well. That's at Rich Mix. So for me, I'm intrigued to see what different people he's bringing in to the mix. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see almost uh, a whole range of work that most people wouldn't get access to be able to see. Yeah. Um, and you talk about taking dance out of the theatres and out into areas, you know, touring outside of London, you know, Zone 5. We're not talking, for those who aren't in London, we're not talking about central London here. This is quite far out. Um, how do you feel that uh, taking dance out into the community and out to where people are makes a difference or perhaps it even affects the type of work that you would choose or show? It's interesting. I don't know if it affects the kind of work I choose. I'm always looking for work that's distinctive, brave, personal, articulate. Um, but I think for me, I'm interested in audience. About half our audience is a very dedicated dance audience um, who uh, we value a lot. And certainly there's work for them in the big dance houses. So we're going to Sadler's Wells and they're going to the Barbican and other well-known venues in London. But I'm also interested in reaching people who might not either want to come into the middle or might not go into a dance house. So I think for me, it's not about the kind of work or the quality of the work, but the kind of politics of going to where people live and where we might put on work at an art centre that they would trust that art centre and maybe go and see dance when they wouldn't otherwise. So I'm really excited. We're partnering with um, a big um, visual arts um, fest called The Big Draw here for the first time. So that's an arts festival right through October, but it's not dance. We're also doing a debate at the National Theatre for the first time. So th these things are interesting to me when we cross over into different art forms and different audiences that might go to those art forms. Yeah, I think um, anything that can be done to bring new audiences to dance um, is obviously very, very important. Um, I think also I'm interested to, to know a bit more about uh, these 
pieces that are going to be presented in really unusual locations, like you say, yeah. Battersea Power Station, um, and that piece you're talking about being inside of a, um, a an opening shipping container sounds incredible. How do you feel that pre presenting works in these types of spaces affects the audience's experience of dance, or do you think it makes it more exciting for audiences to, to come along, or what do you, what do you think? Yes, I mean, um, Origami, for example, we're doing, um, it's outside and it's free and four of the five venues we're going to are down the river. So I, I love the thought of people coming across things by chance also, um, things that might be transformative by catching something that they didn't know what, what was coming um, in the city. And it's something I love about using the city as a location. So those sorts of venues are just really exciting for me. We're doing another piece in, a, in an area of wasteland right near City Airport in the east of um, London. I spend a lot of the winter every year. I seem to just be traveling around to desolate places. Um, but we're working with this fantastic artist, Charlotte Spencer there. And oh, I've interviewed Charlotte. She's okay. amazing. Is this for her She's piece? Great. Is it a wasteland? Yeah, that's right. Is this a wasteland? I think it's Is called. Is this a wasteland? Yeah. It's called. And so that's also really interesting because it's going to be changing. That location is changing. And in a short amount of time, um, that will be used in a different way than it is next month. So I love that fact where people walking by, whether they go by on the train or walking, they will remember something that they experienced there that has now gone. And I quite like using the city as it's changing. Yeah, that sounds absolutely amazing. And there's something about this intrinsic nature of dance that's almost within us. It's this almost natural language that we, we all have, even if we dance professionally, we don't dance at all. I think it's something which a lot of people can connect with and yeah. being able to, as you say, stumble upon or glimpse or experience these moments of dance uh, everywhere across London will be amazing, particularly for free work as well, which is, mm -hmm. can also be a barrier for people being able to experience dance. Yeah. I wanted to ask, how do you, you mentioned some winters, you're traveling out to some desolate locations. As the artistic director, how do you go about curating such an extensive and extraordinary program? Um, I do a lot of research, basically. I travel a lot. Um, I see about 200 shows a year. Um, so uh, it's partly looking for things that I think are commenting on today, that are contemporary, that are speaking about the world in which we're living now. Um, it's, that doesn't often mean overt politics because I don't think dance does facts very well. I think it does suggestion and I think it can do moods and states and comment in lots of different ways about the world around us that's not necessarily politics with a capital P. But um, I'm interested in artists that are living in the current, in the present, and that's partly people inventing their own vocabulary, which I suppose for me is always the big difference between classical work and contemporary. Um, so uh, partly I'm looking for those things that I, I, I mentioned before, you know, work that's distinctive, that's personal, that's brave, that's articulate. Those are kind of some of the key things I look for. But also I'm very interested in diversity and all the different ways that you can call that. So some of it is about location. So going from the big houses to small art centres in outer London, whatever. Um, some of it's about style. Um, like I said, we, you know, every year, you know, we've had ice skaters or we've had hip hop or we've got uh, modern flamenco now. Um, it's that range excites me. Um, and then also, I'm I'm looking at age. Always, there's a couple of things for children. I feel really passionately we need to give young people the best art that we can now. Not because they're going to be the audiences of tomorrow, but because they're living now. <laughs> so I always have some work for younger audiences specifically. Um, and finally, also things like gender and cultural diversity, just always in the mix. So I keep the frame quite tight, but we then try and tour the work as much as we can. So it is always a juggle, um, but it's an exciting one because it's the mixture that is also part of what I want to do, not just the quality or the scale. You pick up on some really interesting topics there. First of all, gender and diversity in dance and in dance makers and yeah. the voice of dance. And this is an area that I'm particularly interested in and we've talked uh, quite a bit about on, on this program um, in relation to the challenges that female choreographers um, have been expressing in terms of their challenges. Yeah. Um, 
the other, um, we'll come back to that. And the other um, thing that I picked up there for me is about you know, the presenting work for children. I, yeah. I remember when I was growing up, it was, I was dragged off to every festival um, <laughs> in Australia by, <laughs> and saw <laughs> the most extraordinary range of uh, uh, works, not, not yeah. just dance, puppetry yeah. and theatre, which was really instrumental. I can still vividly recall works that I saw when I must have been 10 or something. Mm. Um, and so I'm really interested in, and I wasn't aware that Dars Umbrella is trying to, you know, deliver works that would be, ex mm. you know, something for, for children. I think that's amazing. It's something I've done for about 15 years. And when I, yeah. I was purely selfish, I had, my daughter was three and I, there was nothing I could take her to. And I thought, this is mad. This is an art, art form that's to do with physicality in the body. Um, and so when I was, uh, was working at the place and it was when I first stopped dancing and I set up something called Offspring, which was a festival, you know, it was the first sort of little festival of contemporary dance for kids. And I've done it ever since, um, set up Family Weekend when I was at Sadler's Wells, which I'm really happy is still going on now. And so, yeah, you know, I'm doing nine or 10 shows, international shows a year in the festival. Um, and two of them are always for younger audiences. Some we've done really for babies. We did a piece called 16 Singers that was for sort of six months to kind of three years. It was really for very, very little ones. This year we've got a fantastic Spanish company called Company Madusta who are doing a piece with projections called Dot and that's touring around out of London. But again, I think it's really beautifully crafted, carefully choreographed, well-performed work for children. And um, I was at a talk the other day when someone asked everyone who um, in the room if they to put up their hand, if they if they'd got into the art form they were working in after they left school and no one put up their hand because so many of us get drawn into it when we're younger, either by studying or by watching, if we're lucky enough to have um, parents or carers that take us to things. And so, yeah, that's why it feels really important to include them in the mix. They are the audience. They are part of the people who make up our society. 26% um, of uh, young people, um, sorry, 64% of young people in London live in outer London because it's very expensive in the city. So families generally live, um, as with many cities, a little bit outside the centre. So again, the tour that we're doing there is in outer London art centres. That's a, There's a really clear reason why. But um, yeah, we've commissioned work and produced it. And I, I think it's really, it's a very key part of what I think we can do not being in a building. Yeah, absolutely. Dance Umbrella for Families. That's mm. amazing. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about um, gender and diversity, <laughs> in, which is um, obviously a hot topic. Yeah. Um, tell us about your, you know, your personal professional views yourself and also what Dance Umbrella is doing to uh, have some positive impacts in, in this. Yeah, concept. it's such a big issue. It's such a continuing issue. I mean, I think... Um, the changes are coming. I mean, Saudi Arabia just <laughs> allowed yes. women to drive yesterday. <laughs> so, um, getting there, getting there. Um, yeah, I think for me, uh, as with the, any of these things, it's about just looking a little harder or digging a little deeper to find what you need. And yeah, I think two thirds of the work this year is by women. Um, I consciously try and look for work by women. Um, it needs the extra push because the guys tend to be more on my case. It's really interesting. Um, so I've heard that before. Yeah, yeah. and so, um, yeah, that, then I, it's something I do prioritise quite actively. Um, and, you know, it, it changes e each year, but I don't think it's ever, uh, it's never been below about 55% in terms of women. This year it's two-thirds. It's two Next year's looking a little bit more male <laughs> but um generally in terms of the support we can give whether it's research mentoring advice commissioning i do try and um focus on that just to help rebalance the history a little bit i think you know i think um it, it's the legacy is also if companies are doing revivals or remounting things of course there's always so much more work by men yeah I'm also interested, I'm talking with the company next year about possibly putting on a piece they've done and the, na the name of the company is not the name of the woman who runs it. And often men tend to have the names of the companies in their name also. 
So it's an interesting thing for me about visibility as well as mm. about the data and the sort of number crunching of how, how much we balance it out. It's also to do with audiences. And I think it, that's why I feel like it's an issue that is we work in a, it's quite a democratic art form. I mean, if people want to go and see work, they pay to go and see work. And so for me, it's also interesting about how we as a society take women seriously, recognize female genius um, more slowly than male genius. Do we, you know, these, these questions are, um, I find them really interesting. So it's not yeah. just about those of us that have the privilege of being in a position where we can um, share artists that we think are exciting with the public. It's also about the public and the press and how we are reviewed and the funders as well. So it's a, big you know it's a big part of that discussion I, I think it's really really current here in the UK the question of diversity is at every meeting I ever go to so I'm hoping that there's um change has been an interesting um new appointment recently of the new director at the Young Vic Theatre here and so in terms of both cultural and gender kind of balance I think I'm hoping that we're heading in a slightly more um even playing field yeah absolutely um I I, I also hope that it uh, continues to uh, become more even and more reflective of the society in which we live. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your views also you know, with 30 years of um, experience in dance performance and programming and you were a dancer yourself. Mm. Um, how do you feel that defining dance impacts what audiences oh. see as, as well? Because, you know, what is Do you mean dancing? how... Yeah. Do you mean how we write about it or actually no, how like, we define the, the term? The, the what is dance, you know, yeah. the boundaries of what we, we would define as dance. I find it quite, I don't, you know, the term contemporary dance I don't like very much and I don't use it much in print or on our website. I think it's a little off-putting for people. I always think people think, what what is it? You know, they don't know what it is. Um, it, it's something there's so many artists now working right at the edges, whether it's um, performance, live art, whether it's like Charlotte's making work with headphones, which is a completely, the piece is like a different kind of um, art form. You know, it's, it is made by a choreographer and yes. the, the way that you watch the piece and you go through the piece, I think she's using space and time in a totally choreographic way. But no one's dancing. We're moving, but we're not really dancing. And nor is she, she kind of choreographing us in any steps in sort of she's guiding us in space to do things but it's so it's a different way of working and all those people that are right on the edge are often the artists I find most exciting the ones that are quite hard to define um a lot of that work is just something that I think is really it's really interesting so um as a as a word I <laughs> I, I, my edge in terms of programming is stuff that's led by movement. That's how I define it. It has to be led by movement. If, there's, if the text is the key thing, it's not uh, legitimate mm -hmm. <laughs> for me. Yep. Um, but how you look at that movement is really, uh, how you can define that movement is really broad and wide and the artist is stretching it to, uh, you know, right to the edges of how we might define it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's always interesting when you see a piece and you sit there and think, is this dance? And I love that asking oneself that question <laughs> actually asks so many other questions as well and yeah. to be drawn into that internal um, sort of dialogue about my, my own uh, thoughts about, well, what is dance and yeah. what is legitimately dance or, you know, why, is, why would this not be dance? It's, yeah. quite, it's an interesting, as an audience member, it's an interesting it is, place uh, to be in terms of thinking and challenging. And I think we're asked it more and more often. I just did, we're doing a series of talks on Facebook Live called My Dance DNA. And we just did one with Siobhan Davis on Friday. And she was just talking about the beauty of everyday movement, of the miracle of just walking and how we actually organize our bodies to do very um, everyday movement or pedestrian movement. So I think that's also interesting. You know, she's a hugely experienced artist and she's actually come back from dancing um, with done contemporary dance theatre and, and Richard Alston, sex aside, all these people to actually looking at the real detail of daily movement. So that for me is quite an interesting journey, sort of back to the less choreographed in, um, in a, from an audience point of view, but still totally to do with movement. So that range is fascinating. Yeah, that, that would be a quite, an, quite an interesting um, view, I think, you know, getting, mm. pairing it right back to... The, the physical mechanics of how we actually move. It's, it's, yeah. well, it's 
almost. It's amazing, actually. Um, I also wanted to ask about um, the impact of digital technologies on dance. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, with the uh, advent of social media, dance is more and more popular. I think um, particularly the visualisation of dance and classical ballet mainly um, is so prevalent across social media and um, yeah. drawing in huge audiences or interest in, in dance. How, how, what do you see the, the impacts both in terms of digital, digital technologies on audiences participation and access but also in terms of how works, how it influences work that is created um, and presented? It's a huge question, I think. Uh, Sorry, that was a big one. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose what's interesting for me is where that crosses over into live performance, actually. It, it's where it's, um, I think, when we're looking at stuff online, it does, it, it's, I think it's one of the most searchful things on, on Vimeo and YouTube, and um, it's watched hugely. So that's exciting in terms of people's appreciation, um, understanding, including historically being able to search back and look for things. I think um, programs um, here in the UK like Stri Strictly uh, Come Dancing, they really help people understand technique and progression and learning in the body and, and um, te te technique. So all of those things I think are great. I don't know um, enough about the data about how and if those audiences then go to do um, dance themselves or watch it so I think I, I suppose I'm such an advocate of the live experience that you can get um, the impact that it has on you as a viewer both um, in in participatory work or in in in, in tr more traditional theatre spaces so um, that that's the connection that I find yeah. really interesting is is if and how it, it's going to translate into people actually seeing and watching and enjoying performance live performance and my feeling where they is can. It, yeah. yeah where they can and my feeling is it it will grow I, I think especially I keep hearing about all how we're getting we're going to get more and more robotized whatever the word is <laughs> <laughs> just how robots are gonna be taking more and more jobs in mm. the next 20 30 years and I think it's going to push things back onto the human onto the physical on, onto the participatory onto the things that connect us uh, so I'm quite excited about how culture as a as a whole for, for people learning doing watching um, studying is is going to be uh, affected for the better as a result of that because it is such a connector I think yeah there, there is certainly Nothing, you know, I agree. There's nothing that can replace the personal experience of going into mm. a space uh, and seeing dance and mm. being up close, particularly if you're lucky enough to be able to get up close to the artists yeah. and be able to see them live. There's nothing like that. I think it's great to be able to access dance um, if you don't live somewhere where there is, there is arts available. Absolutely. The and the live streaming and the cinema stuff that's happening Definitely. now is fantastic. I mean, it, at present, it's still with the bigger companies and the bigger organisations, but I think that's changing. And like I was saying with our My Dance DNA talks, they're, they're, they're looking at inspirations of different artists using clips of films, both from their childhood or for, that they choose um, of things that have inspired them and then some of their own work. And it's a format that will only work digitally. It's just yeah. on Facebook Live, and we've done it particularly to look at choreography using the medium. Uh, so I think there's fantastic ways that we can do that um, with artists, with dancers, with people working in the profession in different ways. And I'm, that, that's quite an exciting journey for me. Yeah, I think um, seeing, you know, obviously, again, mainly ballet dancers who have got social media followings or, you know, heading towards the million, mm. um, like Mr. Copeland, for example. I mean, it's mm. quite extraordinary the amount of attention online yeah. in, so yeah. in social media that dancers yeah. get, which is great. It's amazing. Um, it I think is. there's an interesting challenge around how contemporary dance is, yeah. visual, visual, is visually represented because yeah. um, it doesn't quite break through and, and become as... No, I think we've got a lot to learn. I think we've got a lot to learn. I mean, we spend a lot of time in terms of promos for each show and just images and how we use them. I think it's one of the advantages we have actually over theatre is just that obviously in image you can represent a lot about the style or the kind of work that you might be going to see. But for me, it's the, it's the invitation for people to take a take a leap because we're not doing um, 
plays or you know there's no known writers there's usually not any known titles we don't have the stars that ballet have because we don't generally choose to work that way generally the companies are working in a more collaborative way than having singular people that are being featured usually so i think the invitation that we're making is is quite different and there's a lot we can learn about how to maximize that i think that there is an excitement there i was suddenly freed by the fact that most people don't know most of the names most of the time so uh, for me it, it's going to be about reputation and invitation to the public so that's how the marketing then becomes really interesting about how to do it truthfully but invitingly and um yeah i think we've got a lot to learn still i, I think there's appetite there you know when I, I, look, I, I look at secret um secret cinema or you know all those places where you don't know where you're going and you don't know what you're getting and and i think it's one of our roles is to um, give people confidence to try the unknown yeah um i personally i i don't really like to know very much about what it is that I'm seeing for the first time. <laughs> I love the experience Excellent. of, yeah, of not knowing and of being <laughs> immediately um, absorbed into a, an environment. Um, I tend to do most of my research after, after. Um, because that's I want that immediate in personal impact of the yeah. piece and not oh, to be drawn in. Yeah, it's a personal thing, not to be drawn in by the, the knowledge that affects my um, interaction with the piece or mm. with the dancer or with the choreographer. Yeah. And I do often, um, and I've spoken to a few people in you know, place, for example, about this challenge visually because um, a lot of our followers, it's all about the visualisation and all about these beautiful photos. And, um, and some, when you go and see pieces uh, of contemporary dance or uh, other types of dance and you see something, you think, oh, wow, that would be just, if only people would come and see this. Yeah. They would just, it's incredible because it, it is yeah. incredible. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's a very mm, potent area. <laughs> and yeah. in terms of my job, it's one that I feel, since I feel I'm, part of what I'm trying to do is connect audiences to artists, the kind of that area of how we promote and invite through the information, the images. It's a really, really big area, I think. Yeah. It's fascinating. It is fascinating. And it's interesting as well for me that a lot of the dance photographers are now really famous. They are, yes. you know, they've got, again, hundreds of thousands of followers yeah. and, you know, perhaps they, their reputation may be a gateway of being able to uh, yeah. get engagement in the contemporary it's true. It's dance true, but visualization. It's, but again, it's, it's about that fame, isn't it? It is, but it's also about beauty. And mm. I think that for me, I suppose I, I have lots of questions about these fit, young, um, trim bodies mm. often. <laughs> yeah. And how to try and show different kinds of uh, grace, yeah. rather, you know. Strength. I suppose, yeah. I suppose it's that the, the idea of beauty is often fairly um, constrained. I think so. I'm excited by different ways of looking at how we can look at the beauty of the the, the power of the body in motion in yeah. different ways. Um, yeah. That's quite interesting. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting area. Loaded. Um, yeah, very, very, very mm. much loaded. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> one which, you know, will continue, no doubt. I'm sure. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you, um, finally, as a female artistic director and CEO, which is mm. um, a fantastic position, very inspiring, what advice would you give to either uh, other artists who are leading dance organisations or other um, people who are looking at you in your position and thinking that's the type of thing that I'd love to do, what advice would you give to others? Heavens. Um, Sorry, that's another big question. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that's been interesting um, that uh, I've kept following my passion. It's been very simple in that sense. Um, I've been given good breaks along the way, but uh, I suppose I, I would just... I would advise people to keep following what they love doing best because usually that is what you're good at also. Um, and to just keep working hard and um, pushing forwards on following your heart because it's, it's all we have is that passion to offer and to share. I mean, artists, they don't really need my advice that they're having the courage to do that anyway. But for those of us that are working in the creative field but not as makers 
I think to keep true to yourself, including how you, how you work with people and actually what most excites you and drives you forward, those things are fabulous. It's fuel um, to help change this world. <laughs> um, and I think that's probably the most important thing. That's fantastic. I just want to thank you very much for joining us and talking Pleasure. to us about Dance Umbrella. I'm Pleasure. really excited about it. I'm definitely going to come and see loads of the shows. Um, and for listeners and viewers, um, if you want to learn either more about Dance Umbrella, the different types of shows, choreography, where you can see and buy tickets, visit danceumbrella.co.uk and check out their socials for some of these Dance DNA talks and uh, other snippets that you'll be able to find online. Thanks very much. Don't forget to subscribe. We've got some incredible interviews coming up with principal ballerinas and renowned choreographers. We love dance and ballet, and we hope you'll love us. Join us on Facebook and Twitter.